fear and phobia. Two words that are closely related, but nonetheless command distinct differences in terms of their actual effect. Fear being one of the most primal emotional responses, a rational reaction ingrained into almost every single organism on the planet, developed for the sole purpose of recognizing and avoiding life-threatening danger. Phobias, on the other hand, can be irrational, triggered by a psychological trauma of past experiences, causing the victim to greatly exaggerate a particular fear with the emotional response of debilitating anxiety. However, within the bios of Louisiana existed a macabre creature so vile, malignant and dangerous that its haunting image and lethal potential warranted both rational and irrational reactions of any person brave enough to have laid eyes upon it. Among the countless horrors and atrocities that existed within the sculptor's area of corruption, it would seem almost impossible to point to a particular entity and define its presence and physical appearance as the most revolting of them all. Yet, even the most grotesque and grisly creations of this otherworldly embodiment of Satan would pale in comparison to the abhorrent and repulsive creature known only as the spider. While the term spider might seem accurate upon one's first glance at the creature, considering its eight legs, the two-part body, and the large venomous fangs, a closer look at the testimonies of certain hunters would reveal a far more horrifying truth. In his search for Dr. Reed and his party, deep within the Stillwater Bayous, John Victor, a member of the American Hunters Association, came across a barn strewn full of corpses. Some of them malnourished and starved to death, with the rest torn to pieces, their chests disemboweled and organs consumed. It was clear to John this barn had been their last stand. Doors and windows had been barricaded in a desperate attempt to keep the monsters at bay, while prayers and scriptures covered the walls in what seemed like a futile attempt to slow down the corrupting influence of the sculptor. While there was no sign of Dr. Reed, a local medical practitioner known for his extensive research and rather unconventional methods of experimentation on the infected, John Victor was certain this was Dr. Reed's party. While too late to save the group from their destiny, his initial mission to locate the party had been completed. However, in a surprising turn of compassion and humanity, John Victor decided to give the deceased their final resting ground by burying the group. In the seeping rain pouring from the skies above, John worked tirelessly to dig a grave large enough for the entire party. Cold, wet, and exhausted, he dug out a massive hole, working through both pain and exhaustion in the rain, as the crows greedily circled the barn above him, waiting to tear into the scraps of the massacred bodies. One by one, he would drag out the corpses before dumping them into the grave. Body after body, one corpse took the other, and John spent most of the night filling the massive grave. At the point of collapsing, worn out from exhaustion, John had only one body left, the corpse of a small girl. Her juvenile and innocent face, though covered in blood and her eyes open in a dead stare, the little girl seemed almost peaceful. Tired and weak, John who was as strong as they come didn't have the energy to carry the girl and dragged her by the ankles to the hole before he dumped her in as well. As he filled the grave back up, covering the bodies beneath the dirt, John returned to the AHA, assuming that his mission had been completed. However, this good deed turned out to be one that wouldn't go unpunished, for beneath the dirt and rain, among the worms and deceased in the grave, something 
unexplainable happened. Something dark and wicked. Later in John's life, in another expedition, as he once again ventured into the bios, he would deep within the swamp encounter a creature so vile that any sane person would question their sanity upon first glance. With a piercing scream of sheer pain and terror, a giant spider, larger than anything else he had ever seen within the bios, charged at him. However, it didn't take long for John to realize that this simply wasn't just a big spider. No, this was something out of hell itself. This creature was a contorted mess of limbs, faces, torsos and digits, all fused together in a symbiotic cesspool of perverted biology. This abomination seeming to have been pieced together almost at random, with joints, digits and limbs poking out erratically in all directions, boggled even the mind of John Victor, a seasoned hunter who thought to have seen it all. This heinous amalgamation was truly spawned from the darkest and deepest of nightmares. Its outward appearance alone, more than enough to crush and crumble the spirit of less seasoned hunters. But as the grotesque and macabre pile of body parts charged at him, John froze in his tracks as his eyes met with the spiders. Behind the giant fangs of the creature, he saw two human eyes. He knew those eyes. He had seen them before. He was certain that this was the eyes of the little girl he had buried. Her innocent, peaceful face was dug into the flesh of the body of the spider, torn and twisted by demonic powers, walked into an agonizing grimace that both screamed for death and pleaded for forgiveness. Shocked by the sight of the creature, and stunned by the vicious effect of the venom the monster sprayed at him, John retreated from the bios leaving the spider behind in its lair. Unable to comprehend the evil he had just witnessed, the arms, the legs and the torsos, but most of all the face of the innocent girl, John was certain that the spider was a product of the grave he had dug, and he shook at the thought of the atrocious creature. What a sick and twisted fate for anyone to suffer. As John returned to the AHA, the eyes of the little girl staring at him from within the mangled tissue of the spider was burned onto his retina. As he retold the events of his expedition, his account was met with skepticism and even ridicule. The director of the AHA, Dr. Huff Jones, as well as the researchers of the organization, thought the idea of an arachnid creation to be unlikely too far from the usual method of approach by the corruption. The sculptor seemed to gravitate its creations towards insects and their properties, so how would a spider, a natural predator of insects, coincide with the sculptor's modus operandi? This question would be uncovered by the researcher known as Scopnamiglio, who determined the spider's true purpose. It would seem that the corruption, not unlike any task performed by a human, was subject to failure in both production as well as execution. This meant that the mutated creatures of the sculptor could often become too faulty to carry out their purpose, too mangled to actually function, or somehow wander outside of the sculptor's reach, making them rogue entities to the influence of the corruption. While the spider would be responsible for cocooning and creating the armored, it also solved a much more prominent problem. The spider would first identify a problem within a mutation before either killing or capturing the problem. It would then trap and cocoon the creature to essentially rebuild or repurpose the faulty infection. The spider's purpose within the bios seemed to serve as guardian of the sculptor and the corruption's resources. But alas, another phenomenon would present itself, this one even more perplexing than the previous. For a hunter by the name of Daniel Glanton would one day return from the bios, claiming to have killed the spider. When challenged about this, he would present evidence of its destruction. However, he wouldn't be the first. 
hunter after hunter would come back from the bios, each claiming to have bested this ferocious monster in combat, and each of them able to present irrefutable proof of its death as well. Apparently, the spider would be resurrected, or reassembled upon its destruction. It would seem that there was more than one spider, but never more than one alive at a time. This brought on another unexpected problem for the AHA and the hunters of Louisiana, as the bounty, or proof of kill, that could be collected from the corpse of the spider turned out to be rather valuable, leading to partnerships, friendships, and alliances crumbling under the weight of selfishness and greed as hunters took to the bayous in the hopes of slaying this monster for simple monetary gains. As a simmering storm was brewing within the AHA, John Victor had a dreadful uncertainty that haunted him. Unsure of where to put the blame for this atrocity now running rampant within the dead zone, he was caught between a rock and a hard place, certain that Dr. Reed, even though the man was clearly deranged and mad, was incapable of creating something so vile and despicable. It had to have been something else, something far more sinister. Yet, he couldn't shake the feeling that he himself had helped create this monster, for after all, it was he who buried the bodies in that grave, though he had long since forgotten where he had done it. In an attempt to soothe his guilty conscience, John ventured back into the bayous, looking to find redemption, hoping he could do what the other hunters couldn't, and finally end the terror of this creature for good. This time, he wouldn't flee. Within the Stillwater Bayou, he followed the clues one at a time, each of them slowly taking him closer to the lair of the spider. Eventually, his hunt for the creature led him to Lock Bay Docks, the compound riddled with the wandering corpses of the dead, guarding the lair of the spider. John, however, wasn't about to let anything get in his way. Determined to finish what he had started, John pushed forward into the lair and among the skulls, bones, and cobweb, it didn't take long before the creature made itself present to him. John felt the cold shiver of fear bite into every inch of his body as he once again locked eyes with the creature, the eyes of the little girl looking directly at him. In a threatening posture, the body and limbs of the spider were poised for death, but the eyes, just as before, begged for forgiveness. John loaded his rifle. This time, he would grant the creature both. Hey there, Hazmat here. This was my first attempt at specifically covering one of the bosses of Hunt Showdown, and I would love to hear how you think it turned out in the comments below. As always, a big thanks goes out to the Hunters Lounge on Patreon, specifically Jim and L. Bob, Corey Peterson, Derivative, Ein, Goose, The Loaf of Bread, Tom Hengst, Stas Biestek, Kashi Yuka, Tim Wright, Jane Doe, Nightingale Far, Nebula, Claire and Leon, Gabe Benavides, Sir Bottoms, Riz TP, Ghosty, and Dominic Carlos. The Hunter's Lounge does not only support me as a content creator, they also receive special benefits, such as deciding on future lore episodes, the option to participate in Patreon exclusive events, such as the Patreon Cup, as well as early access and behind the scene content, and you can join the Hunter's Lounge for as little as a single dollar a month. Link is in the description below. I would also like to give a big thanks to both Rexley and Tip from the Hunt Showdown Discord, who always contribute with great input and feedback. And as always, thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next one.